Good evening. Welcome to the Manil Collection. To, this is actually the beginning of our public opening of our fall exhibition, Experiments with Truth, Gandhi and Images of Nonviolence. And it is a really not just a great pleasure, it's an honor to have with us Amar Kanwar, who um, I will introduce to you very quickly. But before I do that, may I ask you, as always, to please uh, silence your cell phones and all these, these devices we, we live with. Um, and let me also mention to you that our bookstore is very happily open today. Our restaurant, which has never existed before, opened yesterday. The bookstore is, has reopened today after being closed for six weeks. Please visit the bookstore. Uh, the, we are, we have been, so, we're, so, we're so happy that it is actually open because the book related to the show is very important and uh, is, uh, of course, uh, uh, for sale, also in here in the gallery. Amar. Amar is based in New Delhi. He has exhibited his film and multi-channel video uh, or film projections um, many, uh, in many, many places. And I will not bore you with his CV, with his biography, because you can really find out a lot about him online. So, and we will have about very interesting, we will, have, we, we will talk about very interesting things. But let me tell you uh, that uh, I saw his work first in 2002 at the Documenta in Germany, which is a very important um, contemporary art show. It's a survey show that is probably the most ambitious it only happens every five years, and I never forgot the piece which is in this show. We will talk about that piece first. He has had uh, solo exhibitions in the, in the Renaissance Society. That was the first one after the Documenta in 2003, the Whitechapel Gallery in London, 2007, and the Stedelijk Museum in Amsterdam, 2008, more recently at the Photo Museum Winterthur in Switzerland, in 2012. He has not only participated in this, uh, really, um, in this really important documenta in 2002, but also in the following two ones in 2007, and the last one was in 2012. Uh, I've seen his work there, uh, and many others have. He uh, also, Amar, after I uh, discovered his work and realized, was really moved by this powerful piece that is down this hallway. It's called A Season Outside from 1997, I believe. Um, he, uh, we really, he really became an important uh, companion. He became a very important uh, person to talk to because this has been a project in the works for many, many years, as I believe many of you know. Um, in other words, artists were very important um, voices in this process. Ha Amar may be the most important one. He, he, uh, we met in Europe mostly, also in the US. He came once to Houston, maybe three years ago. And, we, uh, and I, I do love Skype now, because we did talk, meet on Skype uh, on a regular basis with a group of, of my colleagues here at the Manil, and so he really became kind of an important consulting voice. There are two, two pieces in this show of his. One is the season outside, I already mentioned that. Uh, we'll talk about that first. And then there's the sovereign forest, which is the more recent piece that he also showed in 2012 at the last Documenta, but it is a piece that is really in process. It's not, um, it's not the same piece anymore. It's a very complex work of art, and I invite you to spend uh, time in it. And before, um, and one more uh, element which I find very important, not only is that a piece that you know, is a work of art that changes and is very complex, but it has actually le led to, a, to a, a, an archive in the province of Odisha, Orissa, formerly called, um, which is where this piece uh, takes place. And Amar, I think, will tell us a little bit about that. So there is a kind of a symbolic dialogue or a symbolic partnership here going on between the Manil and also this uh, archive that is now, I believe, self-sustaining 
uh, Amar has really funded it and sustained it himself for, for years. And I think that's, that's another wonderful outcome of that piece. So let's move right into uh, this uh, season outside. And why don't I just ask you, Amar, uh, to maybe explain the title and, uh, or, or whatever you want to say about the piece, the structure and the, the sort of the, the course of the, of the piece. You know, titles are always very tough things. Uh, and uh, it's almost like naming, uh, naming your, your child, you know. I mean, you make a mistake and you're done for, for the rest of your life and you're cursed by your child as well. So, and uh, I'm, I'm always worried about a title and I leave it till the very end. And uh, this title was suggested uh, by a very close friend of mine, uh, Dilip Simeon, who worked with me. He was a historian and uh, who I continuously went to for discussion, for, for discussing, uh, you know, issues while making a season outside. And um, in, in many ways that, uh, I think that, that was one of the first times that I uh, learned the value of a friend who would, uh, an in, extremely intelligent and knowledgeable friend, but nevertheless a friend who is always willing to uh, argue and argue and argue uh, and, and at, at any time. Uh, so this was his suggestion, uh, a season outside, and um, it, it's, it's a strange title. Uh, and there are references to it in the film as well. Uh, but in many ways, uh, I think this film was about looking inside and then looking outside. Uh, and the relationship between what seems to be inside and what seems to be outside constantly. And, uh, the whole question of violence and nonviolence is also is 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 they're, they're, both of them. You cannot understand nonviolence without understanding violence, and and the other way around. You cannot understand life without understanding death, and so on. So in in a in a certain way, um, uh, I think that's how we settle on this onto this title, and and also uh, quite often hope, in a sense, or better times uh, seems just a bit away just outside, just about to happen, something that you go for. Uh, so I think that also worked uh, a little bit in the title. Um. So let's, uh, uh, if you haven't seen the work yet, and we don't want to, you know, reduce the pleasure uh, of discovery this piece, which I believe is a very beautiful piece, it's a film, and it's not, it's a very complex piece, it's very poetic, but it's very powerful. And it starts with the border, with the sequence of the India-Pakistan border, a ritual that happens every day and night, every morning and evening, uh, and uh, meaning closing down the border and opening it in, opening it again. Uh, and you talk about colors there, and that is uh, maybe why don't you briefly talk about that? Yeah, I mean, uh, in many ways, this film. Uh, I think changed a lot of things for the way that I work and um, it's sometimes when you're uh, kind of confronted with, with, with uh, something that you don't totally understand or you do not know how to proceed, it, it's always useful to know what you do not want to do. So in a way when I began I had, I had a list of all the things that I didn't want to do. And uh, one of the things was that I was, I was curious in a way. Uh, because I had done a lot of work before. So I was curious in a way to look at, you know, how do you research, how do you prepare? Is there a difference between researching something and preparing? Um, is there, uh, how does one's instinct work? I mean, do I, do I look differently if I prepare in a certain way? Do I look differently? Uh, uh, do, I, do I respond in a certain, you know, in different kinds of situations? So the border uh, between India and Pakistan uh, was one, um, such area uh, that I, I had taken a decision that I'm, I'm not going to research it. I'm, I've, I've lived with it in my memory and at home and all, all of us have lived with the idea and the knowledge of this quite absurd border. Uh, 
uh, that just suddenly got carved out in families, in my own family as well, uh, had to leave and crisscross. Uh, so we've lived with the absurdity of that event, in a sense, and, and the violence. If you, if you talk about the event, just, let's just make it clear what it means. The event was, of course, the partition, uh, 1947, the partition of India, which was an unprecedented act of political absurdity, in a way, because it was never before, to my knowledge, had a nation, a subcontinent, be divided into nation states according to religions, because India was always a place of many different religions. and. And that was became and it was the, the famous uh, partition was also the day of so-called independence, mm -hmm. which was in August 1947, and we all know uh, that it and it, it led to an enormous wave of violence and massacres, uh, really a kind of a, 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 a suppressed Holocaust. At least a million people were killed, many, many, many women and children, many women. And it was, the, it was a terrible thing. And of course, 10, at least 10 million people were separated. Families were separated and were displaced. And it, it's a very, very, um, uh, well, it's that, it's that event uh, Amar is talking about. And his own family and many others, actually another artist in the show also, were affected by that. Sorry, I didn't want to. Yes, so essentially when you refer to colors, uh, I, I went there quite open. Uh, and uh, not preparing myself uh, with what I would expect, in a sense. And uh, I was quite startled uh, to see that I went there in the morning, and it was like a normal day, uh, and I was quite startled to see uh, the, uh, the handing over of goods between uh, workers, uh, or coolies, uh, as they were also called. Um, so you had Pakistani coolies and you had Indian coolies, and they were exchanging various kinds of goods um, from uh, headloads, basically. And uh, they uh, obviously couldn't cross the they border. They were not allowed to cross. Were, the, you cannot the cross. So you had to ha you had to hand over this headload uh, just an inch before the line. Uh, and, 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 and there's a rhythm. If there are many people coming in and handing over loads, you, you have to get a rhythm so that you, you land your foot just, just two inches before the line. But the first thing that really struck me was that um, uh, we've all grown up with, with Indian coolies or Indian workers uh, working, wearing uh, red color. Uh, working shirt, uh, as a working shirt. And uh, we've all grown up also with uh, a kind of stereotyping of color. And so you, you associate green with, with Islam, in a sense. Uh, so not, not realizing that I was expecting a Pakistani coolie to wear a green shirt and an Indian coolie to wear a red shirt, because that's what I was familiar with. But I saw the Pakistani coolie wearing the red shirt and the Indian coolie wearing the blue shirt, and I was totally confused as to which side I was on. And I think that's, um, you know, that, that's what actually, in a sense, kicked me off. And that's how I, I began yeah. begin the film. Um, though, uh, Let me just add to that. For those who have not seen the film yet, um, it is this film, this beautiful poem-like sequence of pictures, of, of images, and there is a voice talking, and that is Amar's voice. So he, he is uh, speaking this text, just to, for those who have not seen the, the film yet. Yeah. I mean, to just go on to your question about structure and, and you know, how did the film... I think one of the first things that uh, kind of came to me when I began researching were two or three things that I think just immediately came up front. Um, and one of them was that uh, there was just an enormous amount of support for violence. Uh, it, I needed very little research uh, to actually understand and to see um, uh, just the, say, the powerful logic in favor of violence. Um, you push that a little bit further and you found that uh, it was not just one logic, but a spectrum of arguments, in a sense, that favored violence. 
of various kinds. Uh, Do you mean when you were there, when you sort of observed the, uh, or just, no, just even before? Just, just in terms of research, just yeah. in terms yeah. of thinking, just in terms of trying to figure out how to do this. Yeah. Uh, uh, the, the second thing that also struck me was that there was no way I could address the question of violence or non-violence until I had figured it out or at least resolved it at some level for myself. And that if I took a position on it that I hadn't, in a sense, come to myself, then it, it would be a hoax in, in that way. Uh, uh, another, uh, I mean, and I'm, I'm outlining these because these actually, in a sense, then subsequently impacted upon the structure of the film and the way the film uh, went on. Uh, another thing that um, uh, struck me was, which I had mentioned briefly this morning when we were talking, which was that uh, for, for, for Gandhi to uh, make a proposition of nonviolence at a time when the world had seen such an enormous amount of violence in Europe, at a time when you had a pretty violent empire ruling. Uh, the proposition was met with uh, a lot of derision, a lot of criticism, uh, 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 several kinds of attacks. And uh, it was, uh, I mean, you need a brave man actually to bell this cat, you know, uh, of nonviolence in, in, in that kind of situation. Uh, but what, what I'm referring to is the fact that having done that, uh, and done that quite publicly and openly. Um, it was uh, very interesting to see the range of criticism that he got. And he didn't necessarily get criticism from scholars or politicians or, or necessarily, but he got criticism from anybody, from a bus driver, from, from just a everybody felt that it was their right to tell him uh, what was wrong with this point of view. Well, how did he react to it? Um, that is even more fascinating how he reacted to and how he reacted to it was uh, in I think in almost all cases in writing so he wrote back uh, so he accepted the criticism and however ridiculous the criticism was or however complicated it was uh, he made an attempt to respond and, and wrote back wrote extensively and kept on writing even if they were repeatedly <coughs> coming at him. And um, these, these criticisms actually, if you put them together, it's, you, one does not necessarily ha have the you know, opportunity to look at them together. But if you look at them together, you understand violence, because they're all pro-violence arguments. Uh, and he, uh, if I may add to that, yes, so Gandhi's maybe talent to really listen and then integrate and then respond to criticism, which um, there is this wonderful episode, which some of you maybe know, when he w went to England again to, uh, to uh, really lobby in favor of India for the India's independence in 1931. He was invited by the emperor to visit the emperor. It was in the winter time, and Gandhi came with his very spare, sparse clothing in, with naked feet and sandals and uh, the, press, the press in England really um, made fun of him and he and, so, and, uh, and, and, and the reporter asked him before he met the, the emperor, well don't you think you should have uh, more clothes on? Uh, and he responded, I think it's fine because the emperor will have more than enough for both of us. <laughs> and, so he, he, had a, he had a wonderful sense of not, of really, a, actually a great way of, a great kind of diplomatic humor, and very smart, and so. Uh, no, I mean, uh, undoubtedly he was uh, extremely witty. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, and uh, I think, but he used everything in his, you know, capability, every little inch of his brain to respond to this criticism, to these ranges of criticism. So sometimes he, he would respond wittily and sometimes um, with, and, you know, sometimes of course philosophically and with great force and often even inadequately. So let's, let's talk a little bit about some of the chapters in this piece. Um, uh, so there, there's the first sequence is about this India-Pakistan border conflict, which is as Amar said, is how it starts and it also ends with it. 
There, um, there are other uh, sequences, uh, the Tibetan refugee camp, but also this, uh, this uh, chapter we should maybe talk about with the Sikhs. I have asked you even now, I have so far not understood it, but before going there, there's also these uh, rather almost terrifying, very powerful moments where you show scenes of very everyday uh, little actions of violence in, for, ex for example, the animal kingdom. <laughs> Uh, that little puppy, uh, these these birds that sort of pick at that little puppy, it's something very normal, and you know, and it's so. So you are also sort of meditating about violence in the in nature, mm. in the animal world. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's um, it's it's hard to talk about a film if you haven't seen it, um, and I do hope you you see it. Um, there there is just you know, there's, it's a, it's a lot got to do with the way one looks and how one perceives. So for instance, if there's a, if there's, if there are crows that, the sequence that you're referring to is, is crows attacking a puppy uh, and a puppy trying to defend himself uh, from the crows. Um, it, at one level, you could say that this is about looking at violence between, uh, say, you know, within animals and or outside the human territory, in a sense. Um, at another level, what it also does to you is that you immediately identify where you are. Uh, are you with the crows? Are you with the puppy? Uh, uh, without you even knowing. At, at another level, suppose you, you go down further in the film and you have, um, so, I mean, for, uh, for instance, there's a position that it's, you know, it's not me who is in favor of violence. It's actually there's some crazies out there, you know. They are doing it. Uh, and in a sense, that is something as simple as that also becomes a kind of an explanation. It allows me to distance myself from what the crazies are doing to some other poor folk. Mm -hmm. And uh, so if, if uh, so the film actually moves, uh, and, and there are also confusions. I mean, Gandhi, one of the things why I refer to inadequate answers uh, to criticisms is that uh, there's a vulnerability if you, if, you are, if you are publicly inadequate, if you are able to actually uh, be uh, be open about your say uncertainty, and it's this vulnerability. It's this to be in touch with this vulnerability itself actually is his strength. Um, yeah. So uh, and and I think the film um, really succeeds to even indicate that through its own. Filmic, yes. uh, so it's it's yes. yeah it's yes. without being didactic. Uh, yeah, because there is genuine doubt. Uh, on this question, when 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 can I when should I be violent? When should I not be violent? If somebody close to me is attacked, then what do I do? And so on. There is genuine doubt. So uh, the question is to actually relate to the doubt, to relate to the uncertainty, to relate to the confusion, and to to. So it's not really about the. In a sense, the question of nonviolence. Of course, there are many issues about nonviolence, non but it's not just about. A, a, it's not prescriptive. There's there's no argument which is a final argument in that sense, and it's more it's 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 more about engaging. So the more you engage, actually, in a sense, with the question of violence, um, you realize that engaging with the question of violence actually means engaging with your own self. And the more you engage with yourself, you find that actually it starts resolving. It, it, it starts addressing things that are outside of you. And, and that is engaging with oneself is, a, is in, in, in any case, in any life situation, is engaging with doubt mm. all the time in our own lives. So uh, maybe I can um, add to that how <laughs> I feel how true that is, even with the work on this exhibition, because uh, let me tell you, there's been a lot of doubt uh, about this show because I, I know that this is really not self-explanatory, it's complicated. 
It's taken many, many, many years, and it's taken many people helping to think this through. But one thing I have learned is that there is really a very, as you exactly say, and, w and what this film does so beautifully, and when I saw it, I immediately, it was like a revelation. I knew this had to be almost like the end chapter in the show, is there, there is a dialectic relationship between violence and nonviolence. It's not easy. Nonviolence is not a passive sitting back and just waiting, you know, and kind of watching on TV and saying, oh, I'm glad I'm not there. It's much more um, engaged. It's actually, in, term, in the Gandhi's term, it's really, uh, you have to overcome violence, as you say, basically in yourself, but you have also, you have to have the courage to even if you know you will be hurt and maybe even killed, to oppose, you know, to be against uh, this kind of act of destruction. And that's what I believe you will see in the exhibition. It's a, a theme that's very old. It's not that nonviolence is something that has been kind of thought up in the 20th century. It has existed since humankind exists. I mean, without the mother being very tender with the baby, and which, you know, we would not exist. Humankind would simply not exist. So I think this, um, this um, theme of nonviolence has many, many different possible interpretations throughout many religions. And what Gandhi, um, the way Gandhi uh, really thought about it and implemented it into a very uh, strategic political ta 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 um, tactic, and, but also into a way of thinking about life is, is really interesting. Shall we move to the sovereign forest? Yeah, we could, we could do that. Um, I mean, I'll just throw one thing yeah. uh, in reaction to, uh, to a word that you use that, that is also often used, um, which is uh, the question of tactic and the question of strategy. Uh, that would you, is, 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 is nonviolence actually uh, a tactic? And uh, I, think, I think it is possible to suppose that Gandhi would probably not have used the word tactic, or he would not uh, say that it is a strategy. Uh, and I think he would probably say that if it is a strategy, it is bound to fail. Uh, and um, because then m m circumstances may change, and that means then you need to if, you need to evolve another strategy, and that strategy could be you know a violent strategy, depending on 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 the on the on the ground terrain in a sense. And how, suppose you were a general of an army, you would be studying uh, the battleground in a sense, and you would change strategies. Uh, so I think. Um, uh, even it, this is such a slippery terrain. Uh, in fact, even um, I do, I do, even yesterday in the, the brief speeches that were uh, after your speech of the council general, uh, it's a very slippery terrain. When, for instance, if you brief, if you mention uh, duty, and then with duty you connect that. You know, what is rightful duty? And so if you accept duty, then rightful duty, and then rightful duty can very easily move into, it is rightful for me to actually kill. So it's a very, very thin line. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, so in that sense, uh, I think uh, to, to, to some extent, it was, it's probably necessary to say that it's not justified. There's no way you can justify it. it you can understand it. Violence. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, I just, I think it's just, you know, it's good, especially in the context of this exhibition. Uh, there, uh, there's so many powerful works here that um, you, all the people who have been fighting that you can see in this exhibition, I think they've got a force inside them you know, which is far more than a strategic decision. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's very true. Um, and, uh, yes, so, so and by the way, that's what I find um, the most, 
the most uh, maybe powerful really about the piece, the season outside, that it that sort of diff, that fragility almost of this this tension between violence and nonviolence is never left. You know, it's never it never becomes kind of a simplistic. Uh, there's never any doubt that this is a very uh, uh, the way you resolve it poetically is is amazing. So. Um, Let's talk about uh, the more recent work that is actually a work really in progress, I believe, or it's a work that evolves. And so the, the Sovereign Forest, why don't you just uh, say again what the title means, The Sovereign Forest. I think it's time for us to question the whole concept of sovereignty and fundamentally. Uh, and the whole question of uh, uh, who owns what. Uh, whether it's a question of land, whether it's a question of a tree or a river or the air, or whether it's a question of uh, morality uh, uh, and, and so on. And um, it's not that this has not been questioned before, uh, but uh, I think it's, it's time to uh, continuously bring it uh, even more so, center stage on the table, uh, and 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 interrogate it, and interrogate it furiously from every dimension. And so, in that sense, um, I uh, chose the word sovereignty or sovereign forest. Um, also, um, you know, who owns a tree? Uh, who owns a forest? Uh, and is a forest sovereign in itself? Is, is the forest greater than India as a nation? Is it greater than the United States? Or is, is all forests subservient to, to the nation? The nation can do what it wants. Uh, also, forest symbolically uh, means multitude, means multiplicity, means multiple species. This is not a plantation. Uh, it, it, is a, it is a forest where many things grow and interact. Um, so you cannot control it, it owns itself. <clears throat> so there were, there, these are many reasons in, you know, behind the title. Well, and I'm, 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 I'm actually so glad because we didn't really think we would talk about the title, but uh, and, uh, we know all how completely uh, uh, timely this is because I think the whole you know, uh, discussions about climate change and so on, we know that if Brazil just cuts down all their, their forests, the, the, the world will, will be in much, 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 much bigger trouble. So it is true that this is a way bigger than a nation state issue. But, uh, but there is, of course, a specific site that you are talking about in this, in this, in this, in this work. So why don't you talk about that? Yeah, uh, I mean, I, th I think I'll probably try to just give uh, an idea of what, why I ended up with making this work, uh, and uh, and perhaps then it, by the side by side you mean the state of Orissa and why I went yeah. there. But I mean, I think I'll connect it to a season outside. I connect it to the question of violence briefly as a, as a kind of explanation as to why this particular work emerged or began and. Uh, in, I mean, briefly, I would, it's very hard for me to speak briefly, but uh, <laughs> uh, I will try. Uh, but, you know, I mean, in, in 96, uh, when I was doing a season outside, trying to work on a season outside, and dealing with um, serious questions of violence that I saw happening around me, uh, for instance, the... That is his piece. It just spoke. Yeah. Just in case it, you sleep in, the, in it, so it has to wake you up. So. Uh, but, um, I mean, in, uh, we saw, uh, of course, we saw violence in 47. I saw a, a lot of uh, really gruesome violence in my own city in 1984. So we, had, we grew up seeing many dimensions of this kind of violence. Um, and at that time, uh, I felt, uh, that perhaps what one needs to be able to move forward is to be, uh, to, to be able to talk to each other. 
and that we are not talking to each other, we are not listening, we are not, there's no dialogue in a sense. And that if we were able to dialogue, then things would sort out on its own. And then I think um, o over a period of time, I, I began to feel that, you know, everybody was dialoguing, but everybody was quite super articulate in a sense. And this was a kind of a mess of super articulation where everybody was brilliantly articulate, but actually nobody was listening. It didn't really shift positions in any fundamental sense. Uh, around at, at that time, I felt that perhaps uh, how, you know, it's, it's, maybe there's a problem with the articulation. Maybe it's about what one is saying that there is a problem with. And that uh, uh, perhaps if one were able to, to, to speak uh, to, or to understand poetry, uh, if, if, we, if, if I was not arguing with you my position, but if I was expressing my position through poetry, if I was understanding the passage of time, uh, and so were you, then perhaps we would actually shift at some level internally. Uh, I think I haven't totally given up on this position, but uh, a few years later I began to feel that even before I could speak about poetry or I could, or we could try to look at the poetry of, of existence, uh, I felt all, like almost needing to retreat even further. Uh, and uh, began to think that perhaps before I even talk about poetry or before I even dialogue, maybe we, I need to figure out how to look first. And that maybe, maybe there's a certain way of looking that needs to be understood first. And I think that in some senses was partly the genesis of the Sovereign Forest, which is that no, continuously it seems that, it seemed to me that a, that a crime would wreck her it would keep on happening. And the, the simple, commonsensical, logical question that would emerge is that, why is it recurring? And if it's recurring, then either everybody wants it to recur, and they think it's good that the violence continues, or they don't see it. Or just the last thing is that maybe they don't, they don't know, or maybe we don't know, what, what the real crime is. And that's why we, it's, it's recurring. So there, the piece consists of uh, different um, materials and structures, one of which is the film, the, the film that you just heard the sound, it's the only really loud sound, uh, which is called a scene of crime which is the first thing you see, there is a wall with documents relating to the piece. All belongs to the same piece, the Sovereign Forest. There are these species of rice, which it would be nice for you to talk about. There are the books, handmade, uh, with projections, there and, uh, I already mentioned, and there are the photos, too. So the piece is very, um, has many different facets, and they, but they're all interlinked. So why don't we, you quickly talk about the film first, because that's what one sees first, and it's a, it's a very, again, it's a very beautiful poem. It's a, it's, it's, you sit there and there's again, uh, there's no speaking voice, but there is writing, it's like poems really, and it's these beautiful pictures. Yeah, I mean, as I was saying about looking, uh, the scene of crime, uh, after every crime, the first thing the police does is to go and look at the scene of crime. So I thought, let's just take a look at the terrain of the scene of, of the scene of crime first, before I argue about it, and before we kind of go any further. Um, and if I may, uh, before I get into all the other elements that are there around it, um, very simply speaking, uh, if there is a crime that takes place and there's an investigation that takes place, that follows, um, the investigation collects evidence. Uh, the evidence is then subsequently uh, uh, submitted to a court of law or to the criminal justice system of any country. Uh, 
the law of the land of any country defines which evidence is permissible to be presented in court and which evidence is inadmissible, not valid. So out of all the evidence that is collected by the investigating agency, the inadmissible evidence is dismissed and removed. Only the permissible evidence is presented before the judge. The judge analyzes this permissible evidence, permissible as defined by law, and comes to a conclusion about the crime. That conclusion is publicly proclaimed, and we all live with that conclusion. We accept that conclusion. So my question is, what if the law defined permissible evidence incorrectly? Which then, if, if momentarily we were to, to accept that possibility, then it means the evidence that it defines as permissible itself may be incorrect. That is on his table, or on the judge's table. So what the Sovereign Forest does is that it presents to you the film, the scene of crime. Every image of the scene of crime is, is acquired land. So it's every tree, water, leaf, whatever you see in the film is destined to not exist because it's acquired to be used by, for whatever reason. Uh, whether it's mining or whether it's corporations or whether it's ports or industry or whatever reason public good as defined by the, by the nation. Um, and along with the scene of crime, along with you looking at the scene of crime, is a constellation of evidence, of impermissible, in, not valid evidence that presents to you a range of vocabularies and tools and methods so as to understand the crime totally, totally differently. Asking, therefore, presuming and, and raising the question that if I do not know what I've lost, or if you do not know what you've lost, then how do you proceed? How do you even understand it? How do you compensate it? How do you address it? How do you deal with it? And so, for instance, the 272 over here, it's 200 uh, varieties of rice that are presented. So, if you were to take a piece of land, and suppose I were to take your piece of land away, how would I compensate you? You've lost your land. I'm compensating you for your piece of land. The standard way of compensating you would be for me to measure your land and calculate what the market value is of that land at that point. And if I was fair, I would give you the amount of money uh, is the value of your land. Uh, but what if I were to say that in that piece of land, uh, there were 272 varieties of rice that grew that took 800 years, 700 years to develop over a large knowledge system of experimenting by local farmers, wherein one rice was for, for you know, more rainfall, one for less, one for sandy soil, one for meat, one for sweets, one for, I mean, dozens and dozens of reasons as to why each species was conceived, experimented, grown, and sustained. Uh, then how would you calculate the value of this, two, of this knowledge system? How would, how would I com com compensate you? Uh, what if I said each seed had a song and each seed had a recipe? And if the seed goes, the song goes, then, and maybe with that particular song an instrument is there, and if that instrument goes, then how do I compensate? So in, in a sense, if, if one does not understand the meaning, scale, and depth of what we lose, then there's no way we can even relate to it. So that's what the Sovereign Forest is about. It's a constellation of evidence and multiple vocabularies that keeps interconnecting with each other in the form of fables, objects, stories, facts, information that help you to actually look at crime and in a sense look at life in a non-forensic manner. That's a wonderful explanation of the the work. Now, let's, pre let's talk about a little bit about how did you work? How did you, you know, engage the community? You worked years on this piece. Uh, you, you, you yourself collected evidence as an artist. And how did you engage the community? I mean, how did you get to know, how did they get to trust you? Because this was a very, com uh, very complicated situation. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think this, it's, it's 10 years, 10, 12 years, 
uh, of work, so it's very hard to precisely say that. But um, you know, there's a problem. There's so many problems. I mean, there's a problem about trust itself. You know, trust. Uh, there's a problem about wanting to make a product immediately. You know, all of us want. We have objectives. We want to get in. We want to make something. We want to take it out, show it out, and uh, and there's a kind of a drive to produce and deliver, in a sense. And there's therefore also a drive to win trust. And this terrain of winning trust is also very complicated and, and, and sometimes can be very self-serving. So uh, one of the things that, that upset me and what I wanted to do was actually try to do something that not, does not necessarily result in an end in something that is concrete that can be put on the table in that sense. And so to look at actually, even to look at an institution, for instance, as a process rather than a fixed entity. So how do you look at institutions as processes over a period of time? How can, how can it become visible and invisible? How to accept an institution disappearing rather than instead of clinging on it and, and holding it and holding it and so on. So, um, in a terrain where there is conflict, in a terrain where there is a lot of violence, um, there are a lot of people who come there uh, to help. But there are a lot of people who come there also because they gain from violence. And um, I felt that while working, I wanted to work in Orissa, but there was, there was no way that I was going to be able to work without actually working uh, slowly, mm -hmm. over duration, over time, so that people could understand what I'm doing, why I'm doing, figure me out, decide to collaborate or not collaborate. And there's no way this project could have happened without actually multiple collaborations, whether it's with the farmer who's growing the seeds, whether it's with a, a media organization, Samadrushti, that is working with a range of you know activist issues, research issues, and so mm -hmm. on. So it's just, it's actually, not only is the work a constellation, but it's also a constellation of collaborations with many people to be able to get this far. There's also a narrative, especially in the film. I mean, there is a, there is a, a person who speaks. It's a woman. And she talks about the, uh, some loss. And we find out, actually, I believe it's in map five or six, that there was a crime, a murder happened. Can you, uh, is that something, so is that something concrete uh, uh, which one assumes? And can you say something about that? See, we are, in a sense, what your, the narrative is a love story. Uh, and uh, one of the things about a love story is that, about, about love in a way, is that you come together in the most beautiful ways and you separate in the most painful ways as well. And it's when you come together in the most beautiful way, do you sometimes, for a moment, really, you, you get a glimpse of what, how lovely it is to be and to care and to give. And when you separate, you also get to, get to know how, how painful, you know, the core of any form of separation is. Uh, when, you, when you lose somebody, I don't mean just, I mean, somebody could die as well. Uh, so uh, it is a love story, uh, and the murder that you're referring to, um, in in one way, is a figurative murder. It's a it's a metaphoric murder uh, of the man that she loves. Uh, but it's not any murder. We are living in an age of what you could um, say politely call uh, extrajudicial executions. Every nation state eliminates people outside the court of law. Uh, and they have their own rationale for reasons why they need to kill X or Y. And these killings are sanctioned by the state, of every state. And they are sanctioned, but they do not go through the due process of law. Uh, and that's why they have even an almost acceptable term of extrajudicial killings. When you have an extrajudicial killing, of course, you have evidence of the murder, but if it's outside the court of law, how do you, how, how, what do you do? 
So you have to end, you have to bring a, an order to execute the execution, the death, and you have to bring the evidence into a court uh, or a legal system that in, in itself is denying the existence of the murder itself. And that's what the murder is. Yeah, so in a way the person who uh, experiences the loss uh, does not know whether the, the loss is inside or outside. Yeah. Which is, uh, it's, not, it's not death, but yeah. it's not life either. Yeah. It's, yeah. Yeah. If a judicial system does not accept that a man has been killed, then he is neither dead nor alive. Yeah. Yeah. And until he is legally dead, he is alive. And if he is alive, then it is our duty to search for him. Let's so. talk about the piece against speaks um, uh, sound. I think that's one of the be one of the masterful ways. How I mean, you work with image, obviously, but the sound is very. How do you how do you work with sound? I know that's a big question. No, um, I think in this particular film. Um, there's a tree, there's a very beautiful tree in this film. And um, I, I kept on working and researching and never felt I was ready to film until I saw the tree. When I saw the tree, I said, okay, we, 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 no matter what happens to the film, we, we'll survive, you know, we'll make something about the tree. And um, uh, when, it's, it's, it takes a while to get to this tree. Uh, and it's a, it's a bit much, so you have to fly, and you have to drive, and, and then when you really get to it, there's a river, uh, which, uh, so you have to organize a boat, and it's, it's, it's so we, we did that with all our equipment and our uh, crew and everybody, and then when we got to the tree, uh, the, the sound recordist and the cinematographer said, uh, what are we going to record now? Uh, and you'll see the tree when you, when you get so I said, I don't know, uh, let's just wait under the tree. So after, you know, wait for how long, 20 minutes, uh, 40 minutes, after half an hour, they said, okay, what, what are we supposed to record? And you know, it's, it's been like one year of planning. This is the first day. So I said, let's just wait for a little, I don't know, I mean, let's wait for a while. And, and in, in a little while, with specific reference to your question on sound, we began to hear the wind in, in the tree. And then we began to record the wind in the tree and the wind in the grass around the tree. And through the day, the wind moved differently. So we stayed under the tree through the day and further on as well, and recorded the wind through the grass, the wind through the tree in the morning, in the afternoon, very strong, very light, and so on. In that sense, we have, in the film, you have a, the, uh, the soundtrack predominantly is a spectrum of breeze in, dif in different ways. So yeah. I think in, that's how I, you know, I, I worked here. So. Yeah. There's also, uh, the, there's this, um, the, let's talk this more cinematographic as a, there's a several, um, sequences where you use the sort of slow motion technique uh, and um, like with the goats there's this beautiful kind of silent movement or, or sequence with the goats uh, the very amazing and uh, there's also I think the fisherman who throws the net again the sound there is breathtaking it's just beautiful you yeah the, the, when the net falls into the water um, but uh, what about the slow motion uh, technique? Again, I think it, it does, to me at least, it increases this moment of intensity in terms of observation, uh, but yeah. I don't know. I mean, it's, it's uh, simple answer is that if you slow down, you perhaps see a bit more. Uh, so that's one simple answer. And uh, the second answer was, where I was coming from at that point of time, which is I was kind of connecting on to the, to the whole question of breathing. And, and, and uh, I mean, if, if you are, if for those who meditate and for those who are in yoga, this, would, this is like, a, you know, I mean, there's no big deal about 
about knowing this, uh, which is uh, that if, you're, if you have a perception of your breath, and if you have a perception of every inhalation and exhalation, and you can keep this perception going and concentrate just on the inhalation and exhalation, uh, in a while, I presume, those who are able to do that um, have a completely different sense of their own selves and of everything around. They say there's a totally different perception of, of oneself. So uh, uh, I, uh, as a hypothesis, uh, just as was the earlier hypothesis that what if the law is incorrectly defining evidence, as a hypothesis it was that what if I were to not, uh, not, not just slow my breath, but if I were to slow the way I look. So it's not every inhalation and exhalation, but every glance, if I were to, if I, if I, if I can catch how, it's an it's absurd proposition. It doesn't, yeah. you, it cannot rationally or scientifically, I guess you can't hold it. But just as a thought, that if I were to be able to hold every single glance, would it be, would I start seeing something? Would I start perceiving? Would I start looking at things? And in the goats, for instance, there's a beautiful black goat. There are many of them. And then at a certain point, this black goat comes in and looks you straight in the eye. And it's, for me, it's that moment when it's almost like, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not me looking. It's, the, it's, it's me being looked at. And I'm immediately thinking, what must the goat be thinking? And the moment I do that, it's a moment of respect and it's a moment of embarrassment for myself as well. That maybe he saw me. They, they, they did see you. They yeah. do see you. Yeah. They saw yeah. all of us. They saw all of us and you will, you will see them too. So let's, try, let's uh, go towards wrapping it up. But there's two more things I really would love to... Uh, and in a way, you hit right that with... Is there an aesthetic of nonviolence? That, does that exist? Honestly, that was the biggest question I had myself from the very beginning, when I even thought, can that be done? Is there a, you know, is that visually possible to represent such a thing? For me, that moment of a kind of um, beautiful um, eye-opening moment between this sort of encounter between the goat and and in this case you, and the visitor, um, is such a moment. Uh, there's other moments in the show, like the woman who just stops the rage and has the courage to, to you know, speak up and speak with a group of young racist, racist boys. And you can see that, that amazing moment that usually it's not, it's invisible. It doesn't, you know, the press does not, it's not on TV. What you, you see on TV is the, you know, the riot and the smoke and the, the, the noise and the violence. But there are all these moments of, um, of courage. And, of, uh, and so there's also that moment of beauty, in a way, and of encounter. It's a tough question. Is there an aesthetics of nonviolence? Because the moment you were to say yes, then there's a bunch of questions immediately after that. And if you then, since you have already condemned yourself with a yes, then you would have to start substantiating and, and fine-tuning answers to the subsequent questions. Um, maybe a scholar on aesthetics would be able to weave himself or herself out of that predicament, you know, um, and carry on substantiating it. Uh, but I would, if I were to give you a, like a commonplace answer, like a, you know, not answer as, a, as somebody who's a special person, you know, in that sense, who's supposed to know this. I, so I wouldn't want to answer from that position of knowing. I would say that actually there's an aesthetic, there's a non-violent aesthetic of being and of living which involves many things. It involves um, continuous introspection, continuous self-interrogation. It, it involves um, a, a kind of 
openness of, uh, and vulnerability. Uh, it involves caring and many things that we all know of. But um, uh, it's, uh, there, is a, there is an aesthetic of being like that. And if one is able, and it is not necessary that one can be like that all the time. Mm -hmm. But it's about even the process of attempting to be in, in, in that way. And I think that if you, if, if you are able to be in that, then everything that you do, whether you make a painting or whether you talk or whether you walk or whether you bring up a child, whatever you do has the aesthetics in a sense of, of, and beauty of, of nonviolence. And, and you can see it then. Yeah, thank you. I think that is a, I, I believe that after all the, this work that many of us you know, came together to do, including you, Amar, on this show, I think we can say we, d we don't have the answer, certainly. The exhibition is not the answer, but it has many, many questions and attempts to present, offer kind of um, uh, thoughts about that and propositions. Now, uh, let me end by this. Uh, today is Gandhi's birthday. The reason for the show to open today is Gandhi's birthday. So there is a symbolic um, uh, reason to, we changed our whole exhibition programming. We had some real headaches with doing that years ago because you know it's all, uh, but we did that because we felt uh, strongly that we need to, you know, this is a, an important moment. Today is Gandhi's birthday. Um, when I went to India in 2009, I was um, uh, warned actually before I went there by Gandhi's grandson and uh, others that I should be careful because Gandhi is, uh, not, is not a person everyone likes in India. There's a lot of, uh, he's a controversial figure. And recently I've seen him being uh, mentioned more and more and more. So, and you live in India, so why don't, it would be nice if you could give a, and I know this is another loaded question, but, um, <laughs> I mean, Gandhi is, you know, is dead, died in 1948. So he's, he's, but the interesting thing about him is he is more alive maybe than, uh, than ever. Uh, that happens with other great figures. It has certainly happened with Martin Luther King. Uh, it doesn't happen with simple politicians usually. You know, 70 years after these people are gone, they're really gone. And maybe some specialists know about them. So I think, yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, I think if you were to examine Gandhi's life very closely, as many people have done, uh, you would find uh, many contradictions, many problematic things, many yeah. problematic decisions and positions yeah. that favored some, didn't favor the other, and, and so on. And, and uh, there you would find also validity in a certain amount of criticism. Um, however, um, we all know what he did. Uh, in spite of his, his uh, say, uh, mistakes or, or deliberate or otherwise. Um, but to come to your point about this uh, kind of um, associ you know, uh, uh, connecting with Gandhi even more so now, uh, as uh, contrary to what you felt earlier, or what you were told earlier. Uh, I think uh, no matter whether you like him or you don't like him or you detest him, whatever, you, um, you, he's, he's such an incredible figure that you ha you're forced to engage with him. So that's one. Everybody keeps on engaging with him, whether in anger or whether in appreciation. Uh, and I think that's a measure of the man itself. Um, but the second thing is that um, I think if you remember uh, uh, you know, you have to sometimes see that if this, you know, if somebody's hands are uh, blood-stained, um, and uh, that person keeps on washing again and again and again and again, or keeps on saying that my hands are clean, my hands are clean, my hands are clean, um, then you know you have to stop and think for a moment as to you know that it's very, then you know, it becomes very obvious. Uh, that, uh, you, I mean, if your hands are clean, you do not need to say it's clean over and over again. Um, so in many ways, uh, how I see it, and I do not mind a loaded question at all. In fact, I love loaded questions. 
because for me, if I think of October 2nd as Gandhi's birthday, immediately I think of January 30th, which is the day you close this exhibition, mm -hmm. which is when Gandhi was assassinated. Uh, so I, for me, these two are not separable. And they are the reason why we dated the exhibition as we did. Yeah, you begin today, you end on the 30th. So you end on the 30th, and so I'm, I'm, I, therefore, I would point out that it's necessary to remember who assassinated him. It's necessary to remember why he was assassinated. And uh, in a sense, the, the recent kind of, uh, that you see, the recent political kind of co-option of Gandhi is being done by, from the same terrain, from the same tradition that actually was responsible for his assassination. So, I mean, he must be smiling, no doubt, that those responsible for his assassination now find it necessary to actually, uh, you know, um, co-opt him and embrace him repeatedly and repeatedly publicly, almost as if to kind of show that we are, you know, we are absolving, yeah. absolved or, or we are not guilty. So I think uh, the more they co-opt, or the more they try to embrace him, the more, um, you know, this emperor will, is naked. Yeah, okay. <laughs> That's a great end of it. Good. Well, the exhibition is open. We, um, we invite you, we will make, we will make sure, we will uh, put away the chairs quickly so you can all move in. Please come in. And thank you so much, Amar. Thank you again for all your work. <laughs>